A lady in our town, who may be best described as a perpetual talker, was asked by one of her long-suffering neighbors if she ever thought about what she was going to say before saying it. Why, no, said the lady solemnly. How on earth could I know what I think about a thing until I've heard what I have to say on the subject? How often have you seen individuals who behave like that? There are too many of us who do not take the time to pause, delay, and analyze before bursting out into speech. There is enough psychological evidence to point out that it is the individual who is not sure of his facts and the grounds upon which he is making his statements, who bursts out into speech, who defends his position vehemently, who cannot or does not take time to pause and reflect objectively on a matter. Let us make an analysis of three different kinds of responses and see how they can be applied to all situations. Number one is the reflex action. Shine a light into the pupil of your eye and what happens? It closes or constricts, doesn't it? Now this response is the simple reflex action. It is not learned or conditioned. This unconditioned reflex action is immediate, quick, automatic. The stimulus controls the response. This is stimulus control or reflex behavior. There is nothing that the person can do to stop it. Although some psychologists have been able to modify reflex actions to a degree. Yakorzhinsky in his book Medical Psychology says, A puff of air or any tactual stimulus delivered to the cornea of the eye will produce the reflex closure of the eyelid. This is one of the protective mechanisms of the eye. Now, there are many other forms of the unconditioned reflexes or responses, such as chemical changes after the swallowing of food, heart and pulse beats, the patellar reflex elicited by striking the patellar tendon, the plantar reflex to a blunt object drawn over the plantar surface of the foot, salivation to food or acid, gastrointestinal secretions to food, etc. These are all reflex responses which are unlearned, automatic, immediate or quick, where the stimulus controls the response. The stimulus automatically and immediately controls the response. Now there is not much that we can do about the reflex action, and we will not be concerned with it here. But there is much behavior that looks like the above reflex action and the kind that we will be very much concerned with. Let us call this reflex-like behavior a signal reaction. And this is the second behavioral reaction. The signal reaction is reflex-like behavior. It too is quick, immediate, automatic, but the important thing is that it is learned or conditioned you and I have learned to respond impulsively or without thinking. We have been trained in this reflex-like response exactly the same as animals or Pavlov's dogs. I'm sure that you all know how a dog can be conditioned to respond immediately to your words. There is a stimulus and then a quick, immediate, automatic response. For example, when a neighbor telephoned Mrs. Clara Wood of Pocatello, Idaho, that the Wood police dog was romping in her yard, Mrs. Wood told her to put the dog's ear to the phone. Ted, she said, you come right home. Ted was off like a shot and back in his own yard a few minutes later. Here's another example, illustrating the conditioned automatic signal reaction. I was to feed and milk my neighbor's six Jersey cows during her absence. And she said, play these records for them. They love music. If one of them gets troublesome, play this one. She indicated a small disc. 
At my first attempt, two of the cows refused to stand still while I attached the milking machine. I remembered the little record and put it on the player. To my amazement, my friend's voice said sharply, Stand up there and behave yourself, young lady. The cows became meek as lambs and gave no further trouble. Now this kind of an immediate response, controlled by the stimulus, is characteristic of animal-like behavior. A groom trains a horse to go into a stable, even without the groom around. But what happens to a herd of horses who have been so trained when they are outside of the barn and the barn catches fire? The automatic response is to run into the stable. You undoubtedly have read about such cases where horses were burned to death after having run into a burning barn. This signal reaction is what we mean by anti-survival behavior, conditioned responses more characteristic of animals, but inappropriate for humans in that particular situation. The field rat is trained to freeze in the face of danger. He freezes no matter where he is. The situation makes no difference. In some instances, however, this freezing response would be improper and contribute toward its death. Fish have automatic signal reactions toward minnows. To them, all minnows are alike. They do not perceive the important differences between minnow one, minnow two, minnow three, etc. But I think you will agree, a minnow at the end of a fishing line is not quite the same as a minnow not at the end of a fishing line. This is why rat traps are so effective, because to a rat, cheese in one situation is the same as cheese in another. To a rat, cheese is cheese. As we shall see, too often humans respond in the same fashion. In Utah, a total of 1,537 young chickens were scared to death by a lone hoot owl at the Wally Durfee Ranch. Durfee said the owl got into a coop of 4,000 10-week-old chicks after 10 p.m. He found the owl still flying back and forth, trying to get out the next morning. As he untangled the mass of chickens piled up in a corner, he counted 1,537 of them dead. He estimated the loss to $1,350. Now this is not much different from those humans who freeze their responses when a fast-moving car or train is descending upon them. You have undoubtedly read about many cases similar to the individual who was killed by a train. Witnesses told police the crossing gates were down and the person appeared as if frozen when the train approached. The stimulus controlled the response. The stimulus, not the person, controlled the situation. Anyone who looks around him can see the signal reactions. These frozen responses toward people, situations, and things. How often do we have these frozen responses toward new people, different situations or things? Look in the newspapers and you will find many examples of these automatic, conditioned signal reactions. While they might be appropriate for animals, they are inappropriate for humans. They reduce the human level of response to the animal level. The following examples appeared side by side in a newspaper. A 26-year-old policeman early today shot his wife in the head when he mistook her for an intruder in their bedroom. A housewife firing at a man she thought was a burglar shot and killed a downstairs neighbor today, police reported. A policeman shot and killed his roommate and lifelong friend Saturday not realizing that what he thought was a robbery attempt was only a practical joke. Policeman Jonathan Hunt drew his gun when a man came up behind him, pressed something against his back, and said, This is a stick-up. 
Hunt fired as he whirled. As the man fell, he recognized him as his roommate, Ivan Doyle. Doyle had held a finger against Hunt's back. The shooting occurred in the home of Hunt's mother when Hunt, on duty and presumably walking his beat in the Chicago station, went home to get his wallet. He said the wallet contained his identification cards and lunch money. He stopped at his mother's home and was standing in the living room talking to another friend, Arthur Thomas. Thomas recognized Doyle as he walked into the room behind Hunt and was not alarmed when Doyle, smiling over Hunt's shoulder, said it was a robbery. Hunt turned and fired before Thomas could tell him it was just a prank. Here, too, just as in the reflex action, we have a stimulus and a quick, immediate, automatic response. The signal reaction allows no time for proper evaluation. The stimulus controls the response. The signal reaction can get individuals into difficulty in many different ways. What person has not put his foot in his mouth by responding too quickly? For example, as we drove through a small Texas town, we were stopped by a patrol car. My husband, who loves an argument, rallied his forces and met the patrolman with, Now look here, officer, I was only going 35 miles per hour. The officer, who had had his mouth open to speak, clamped it shut. My husband went on, You must have made a mistake. I've been watching my speedometer for the last 10 minutes, and we've been only going 35 miles an hour ever since we left Galveston. Sure that he had made his case, he turned on the ignition. The officer held up his hand and said, Now wait a minute, son. I stopped you to warn you of a detour ahead, but you've convinced me that you were doing 35 miles an hour. Guess I'll have to give you a ticket. The speed limit here is 30 miles. Notice how easy it is to make unjustified assumptions and snap judgments when the signal reaction is involved. It requires little or no thinking at all. In fact, this is the kind of thinking we do when we don't do any thinking. We bypass phase three, the human evaluation phase, in a reflex-like manner going directly from the nervous impact to talk and or act. With a signal reaction, we do not have proper evaluation because we hardly allow an evaluation at all. There is an evaluation, but not based upon the facts. It is usually based upon our false assumptions. It is a contributory factor toward many of the misunderstandings and problems that we find in the world today. Notice how easy it is to jump to conclusions when the signal reaction is involved. In Vancouver, to take a new job, a young woman was searching for a room. She answered several ads, but each time the vacancy had already been filled. Then, on a suburban street, she saw a room for rent sign and dashed through the gate at the same time as a young man obviously on the same mission. The landlady greeted them with, we don't take married couples, and promptly shut the door in the face. The young woman looked at the young man, blushed and smiled, then hastily rang the doorbell. When the landlady appeared again, the girl began, I'm afraid you don't understand. You see, I'm not married to this young man. The landlady gave her a brief black look and this time slammed the door in her face. This is what we might classify as stupid behavior. It is easy to assume knowledge that one does not have, but to acquire the uncommon sense of realizing the limitations of one's knowledge, this is much more difficult. This form of misevaluation manifests itself in many different ways, 
such as in the ability to adjust one's responses from one situation to another. Some signal reactions might lead to disaster. Others, little more than humor. For example, we enlisted men were at bat in a hotly contested baseball game with our officers when a private hit what looked like a single to short right field. Instead of stopping at first, however, he foolishly started a wild dash for second. Realizing then that he couldn't make it, he scrambled back toward first. Now he was being chased in a rundown between the lieutenant playing first and the colonel playing second. It looked like a sure out, but just as the lieutenant flipped the ball back to the colonel, the private snapped to attention, saluting the colonel. Automatically, the colonel snapped a salute back and muffed the catch. I think you will agree that this is a kind of stupid behavior in this situation. There is something wrong with this kind of reaction. When individuals are little able to move above the conditioned animalistic responses of a controlling environment, they cease to behave in a human manner. They literally lower themselves to a lower form of response, adequate perhaps for animals, but not for the complexities and variabilities of human existence. There is one other danger in the signal reaction, and this is commonly rationalized into letting off steam. As an example of this, as my taxi left New York's Penn Station, the driver slammed on the brakes to avoid a pedestrian who darted into our path. When the driver leaned out the window and hurled a string of uncomplimentary epithets, the pedestrian snarled, drop dead. This set my driver off on another round of verbal fireworks, which continued for the next few blocks. Don't you think you'd better calm down, I said finally. Just think what this is doing to your blood pressure. At this, he turned around with a broad grin. You got it all wrong, Mac, he said. You ain't up on your psychology. I got no cause to worry about hypertension. I know how to release my aggressions. Well, upon first glance, this might appear to be a legitimate way to overcome the complexities and problems of daily living. But there is one important danger in such a philosophy. While dogs can be angry and stop instantly, babies can cry and change into laughter immediately, adults manifest what is called the psychology of momentum. The matter we get, the more swear words we use. The more swear words we use, the more we respond to them, and the more angry we become. So, in a circular fashion, we can literally talk ourselves into a quandary, or yell ourselves into a fit of rage by reacting to our own reactions, each time building it up out of all proportions to the original anger or hurt. Psychologists will agree that everyone needs a safety valve, but too often we compound our own problems by not realizing the psychology of momentum inherent in adult reactions. And it's the signal reaction that starts one off in all directions at the same time. In this day and age of atomic and hydrogen bombs, intercontinental ballistic missiles and the ominous threat of a third world war hovering over our heads, it is not totally inconceivable that an enemy might use panic as the ultimate weapon. We might very well ask ourselves, what would we do in the face of an atomic blast or a false and misunderstood warning of attack? Would we take calm emergency action or would we dash screaming into the streets, victims of our own terror, as we saw in Orson Welles' fake Man from Mars radio broadcast of October 30, 1938. 
Even in a war, the whole country's survival might depend upon our reaction to disaster because mass panic might be far more devastating than the bombs themselves. Civil defense officials state that 90% of all emergency measures after an atomic blast will depend on the prevention of panic among the survivors in the first 90 seconds. If humans manifest signal reactions, panic can be fissionable just like the atomic bomb. It can produce a chain reaction more deeply destructive than any explosive known. Just as a single match can burn a dry forest, so a trivial incident can set off a monstrous disaster when the confusion and uneasiness of the population have added to it. Some of you might recall the Coconut Grove nightclub fire in 1942, where 491 people were killed by panic. Safety experts say that if they would have not panicked, taken a fraction of a second, paused, walked out slowly, only a handful of the individuals might have died. Some of the other exits to safety were overlooked in the panic. A fallen man jammed the revolving door at the entrance as the panic guests tried to get out the same way they had entered. In the famous Iroquois Theater fire in Chicago in 1903, the actual fire was so small that performances could have been given there a few days afterward. But one woman's scream started a panic just as the lights went out. Most of the 2,000 patrons surged toward the same inadequate exits. Only one person used a fire escape. Almost all of the 575 who perished were crushed in the frenzied crowd. On June 5, 1941, in Chongqing, China, Japanese bombers returned unexpectedly while thousands of civilians were pouring out of the city's largest air raid shelter. Frantically, they fought their way back into the cave and the guards quickly closed the gates. The ventilation was poor, the oil lamps went out in the foul air, and suddenly panic swept the shelter. People struggled in frenzy toward the air inlets and succeeded only in blocking them. By the time the gates were reopened, nearly 1,000 men, women, and children had died in one of the most horrible civilian panic episodes of modern times. For many years, some federal officials have treated the subject of panic as if it were taboo, or as if nothing could be done about it. But there is much that is known about panic, and there is something that can be done about it. With the proper education and training, we can keep ourselves from acting in panic and signal reactions in situations we can train ourselves in human responses in situations whether war, fires, driving our automobiles, communication, or management. Experiments have shown a great difference between animal and human nature. The most active and intelligent animals such as dogs, monkeys, horses, are frequently the most panic prone. Men appear to be less panicky when they're alert, well-informed, and intelligent. Less intelligent people are much more panic-prone, while children apparently are naturally panic-resistant. They are, however, highly susceptible to the fears of parents, teachers, or other adults to whom they look for guidance. It must be emphasized that fear itself is not panic. Panic is responding to your fear in a fearful manner. It is a circular response. It is reacting to our own reactions. Panic is a second-order abstraction, or fear of fear. As the late President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. 
fear in a fearful situation is proper evaluation. But fear of fear, or fearing fear, especially when not in a fearful situation, this is something else again. Fear is merely the raw material of panic. When you are under attack, fear is natural, even healthy or necessary. But you must use fear, not let it use you. The Japanese were conscious of the relationship between ignorance and fear during the Second World War. An official post-war report on the Hiroshima disaster said, to prevent the spread of rumor and brace morale, 210,000 copies of out-of-town newspapers were brought in daily to replace the destroyed local newspapers. It is no wonder, then, that safety and fire prevention experts are concerned about panic. It should also be a greater concern among government officials and management generally, because signal reactions are both the beginning and the fission of accidents and panic behavior in peace as well as in war. The following example will illustrate this. In Fort Bragg, North Carolina, an assault raft loaded with trainees capsized on a lake at this huge military base, drowning 20 soldiers. It was the worst non-aerial military training tragedy since World War II. The inexperienced recruits, most of them taking basic training, drowned after confusion, fright, and panic broke out when the raft tipped over Wednesday. The pontoon-type craft was 100 yards from shore in Smith Lake, but only two of the 22 soldiers aboard survived. Many of the soldiers were pushed under the 25-foot-long raft by their buddies, who struggled frantically. Rescuers reached the scene within minutes, and ambulances, helicopters, and small boats were used in trying to get the soldiers out. The soldier, whose body was the 20th found, was identified as a man who had managed to swim to safety, but seeing the struggles of his buddies, swam back to try to help them. A witness said he was pulled under. Now the Educational Policies Commission has stated that the purpose which runs through all other educational purposes the common thread of education is the development of the ability to think. What do we mean by thinking? A famous philosopher, F.C.S. Schiller, has said, thinking actually occurs only when an intelligent being capable of thought finds that he has to think. That is, finds himself in a situation where his habits and impulses no longer seem to suffice to guide his actions. He has then to stop to think. Thinking is thus a definite stage in a process of knowing, and the knowing has for its origin the stoppage, and for its aim the guidance of action. William Allenson White has further stated, in the most primitive animals, there is nothing that corresponds to thought. These animals are truly systems of reflexes. The translation from stimulus to action is immediate, smooth, and effective. As we advance in the course of evolution to more complex, higher types, this immediate translation of stimulus into action is ever more and more interrupted until not only the interval between the two is, or may be, considerable, but the resulting reaction becomes less and less predictable. It is in this interval between stimulus and action that thought occurs, that ideas and concepts are formed and formulated into symbols. These definitions of thinking or thought and the difference between man and animal, human responses and animalistic responses, 
beautifully illustrate what Korzybski has defined as the symbol reaction, the human kind of response. Please turn the cassette over for the start of side B at this point. This third kind of a response is the self-controlled or person-controlled response. Intervening between the stimulus and the response is you. You control the stimulus. The stimulus or environment does not control you. For example, do you know what to do if you find a poisonous snake in bed with you? Barry Bradder, 15, can tell you. Barry, sleeping on the lawn of his parents' home, awoke at 6 a.m. to find a two-and-a-half-foot copperhead curled up on his stomach. He waited two hours until the snake slithered away and then shot it with a rifle lying beside him. Man is the only one who can truly react to situations with a self-controlled or person-controlled response. We call this human response a symbol reaction. And this is the third kind of human reaction, the symbol reaction. Now, the symbol reaction constitutes a delay, an observation, an analysis, and then a reaction controlled by the person. A signal reaction, however, is just the opposite. It is immediate, automatic, trigger-like, without delay or observation, and is controlled by the stimulus, not the person. While the signal reaction is an animal-like response, the symbol reaction is a human response with at least the following four characteristics. Number one, pause or delay. Number two, observation. Number three, analysis. And finally, number four, then the reaction. Notice in the following example, one situation but two different ways of responding. Probably the most imperturbable man in the United States was Dr. George V. O'Hanlon, appointed by former Mayor Frank Haig, director of Jersey City's Medical Center. When Orson Welles made his scare broadcast, a student nurse who had tuned in during the middle of the program and had not heard the explanatory introduction became hysterical. She ran screaming to Miss Murdoch, superintendent of nurses. The men from Mars have landed, Miss Murdoch. It's fearful. They're killing everybody and they're approaching Jersey City. Miss Murdoch switched on her radio and only one minute of the carnage was enough for her. She called Dr. O'Hanlon. The men from Mars landed near Princeton, she said. Some of them reached New York and it is totally destroyed. What shall we do, doctor? Order out the ambulances, doctors, and nurses. It's fearful. We may all die. There was a moment's pause, and then the dry voice of Dr. O'Hanlon came precisely over the wire. Let me see. My appointment book is well filled. Tell the men from Mars that I will be able to see them Tuesday morning at 11. Notice the difference between the nurse's response and the doctor's response. With the nurses, there is a stimulus and a very immediate response. But with the doctor's response, in between the stimulus and the response, was the doctor. There was a pause, there was a delay, there was an analysis. Just as we have learned to react in an automatic, quick, impulsive manner, so can we learn to pause, delay, observe, and analyze just a little more than we normally do. While the reflex action is an inborn or unconditioned response, 
the signal and symbol responses are learned or conditioned. We can do something about them. If we have learned to respond automatically or too quickly, we can also learn to pause or delay those responses, if only for a few seconds, to allow the cortex to play a human role. But while man can rise above the animal in his learning, knowledge, and person-controlled response, so man can copy animals in his reflex-like, immediate, automatic signal reactions. The major difference between man and animal here is that man can know that he is behaving like an animal and he can stop it, but the animal cannot know that he is being animal-like. As Mark Van Doren has said, no other animal besides man knows what class it belongs to. No cat knows it is a cat and never has to worry about whether it is doing all right as a cat. Man can be unhuman, but a dog can't be uncanine. The point is that animal-like behavior for the animal is natural, but not so for man. By copying the behavior of animals, man is reverting back to animal behavior rather than behaving in terms of what we know about human behavior and intelligence. Perhaps the distinction between human responses and animal responses and the use of the terms signal and symbol reactions will become clear by quoting Alfred Korzybski directly. It will also help to clarify two very important terms in differentiating between animal and human responses. I am now referring to conditioned and conditional responses. In Science and Sanity, Korzybski states that one of the most important functions of the cerebral cortex is that of reacting to innumerable stimuli of variable significance, which act as signals in animals and symbols in humans, and give means of very subtle adjustment of the organism to the environment. For example, we can train a chimpanzee to respond appropriately to a green or a red traffic light. He can be trained to go at the sight of a green light and stop at a red light. To him or any other animal so conditioned, it is a signal. It is go or stop. He would go or stop no matter what the situation was. To human beings, however, it is a symbol. It means go or stop, maybe. It stands for or represents go or stop, depending upon the situation. Now, while the signal response might be appropriate for animals in a psychology laboratory, they are not appropriate for humans while driving an automobile. But how often have we seen human beings act as if the green light is go, or the red light is stop, no matter what the situation is? Recently, a man driving a large semi-truck killed a mother and six of her children when the woman had gone through a red light. Obviously, it was the woman's fault for having gone through the red light. Whoever's fault it was is not the point here, however. The point is that too many drivers project safety into a green light. They act as if green always means go. As this driver explained to the police, quotes, I had the lights with me. But human responses must be capable of changing the moment the facts of the situation change. Human responses must be conditional, not conditioned. While the signal with the animal is less conditional, absolute, 
or conditional responses of a lower order. Symbols with a human should be many-valued, indefinitely conditional, not automatic. The meanings and therefore the situation as a whole or the context of a given situation become paramount and the reaction should be fully conditional, that is to say, reactions of a higher order, capable of seeing differences and changing according to the unique and changing characteristics of any situation. To quote Alfred Korzybski again in Science and Sanity, he said, in human regression or underdevelopment, human symbols have degenerated to the value of signals effective with animals, the main difference being in the degree of conditionality. Korzybski used to humorously refer to those humans with animalistic or conditioned responses as dogmatists and categorists. The famous philosopher George Santayana has said, the aim of education is the condition of suspended judgment on everything. I should like to emphasize the word condition. To me, that means a psychological predisposition, the ability psychologically to say, I don't know. How easy it is for us to assume knowledge that we do not have, and on the contrary, how difficult it is for us sometimes to admit that we do not know the answer. Too often, however, when we say, I know, learning stops. We don't search further for the answer. But when we say, I don't know, two words often dangle on. They are, Let's see. We go out to search for the answer. Obviously, the quotation from Santayana is extreme and overgeneralized. But as a general orientation toward life and as a specific application for effective communication and intelligent behavior, the values of the pause, delay, and analysis are innumerable. This uncommon sense must be learned not only intellectually, but neurologically or as a way of response. This does not mean that one should procrastinate or wait until all of the facts are in before making a decision or taking action. Greater problems are created when we are so hesitant that we take no action at all. To quote Strecker and Apple in their book, Discovering Ourselves, there are people who appear to think, not merely to ensure effective action, but apparently for the sake of delaying or avoiding action. They are the individuals who analyze situations, problems, and motives ad infinitum. This is the type of person who gets lost in details. They see too much pro and con. There is indecision and wavering. They become so entangled in problems that action rarely or never occurs. If attempts at action are made, they are often feeble and inadequate. Fundamentally, these people seem to lack the ability to face problems and make decisions. We all know those who cannot say yes or no to a fairly simple question. There are others who are given problems and plans to execute, but they come to naught. A man may try to write a book and become submerged in details or see too many debatable points. To this group, too, belong the people who appear to prefer to talk rather than act. Thinking then employed to check spontaneous and hasty action and to clarify issues is fulfilling its proper function. When, however, it is used to dodge issues and avoid making decisions that should be made, 
it is not only not performing its proper service, but it is untrue to its own reason for being. We must react and we must take action. But if our reactions to situations are going to be mature, intelligent, and fitting, we must take a two-second activity delay. We must allow the cortex enough time to differentiate, distinguish, and see the important differences. We should not react automatically, impulsively, or without thinking. For example, if we're driving a car on a snowy day, the pavement is slippery and someone runs out in front of the car, what is the impulsive thing to do? That's right, slam on the brakes. Is that the appropriate thing to do? Well, safety experts point out that one of the causes of accidents is this automatic signal reaction. It is also a barrier to effective communication. It leads one into jumping to conclusions, misunderstandings, and other kinds of misevaluations which might be eliminated or lessened if we were to pause, delay, and analyze just a little more than we normally do. One of the executives in the University of Chicago's Management Development Seminar wrote in our class the following example of his own signal reaction. Without hesitation, I have always said no thank you when offered broccoli. The odd part about this is that I have never tasted broccoli. After giving this weighty problem considerable thought, he said, I believe that this signal reaction is due to the fact that several people have told me about their distaste for this food. Yet even this thought has not come to mind in my past refusals to eat broccoli, and without thinking, I have refused. Even upon reflection of the above sins, I still don't like broccoli, and doubt if in the future I will even handle the question of would you like some broccoli by employing a symbol reaction. If I am insane, please help me. Well, while this person is not insane, this is certainly an unsane semantic reaction. But he is not alone. How many of us dislike foods we have never tasted or react signally to the names of foods we dislike, although the food might have been prepared in a most palatable manner? But notice, not only from this example, but from our own behavior, how difficult this is to apply. We might understand something intellectually, but to behave in terms of the principles, this is much more difficult. The symbol reaction should play a more prominent role in communication and human relations. One of the reasons why we have so many disagreements and arguments is because we don't take the time to listen to people to hear what they say, or listen from their point of view. Just listen to arguments between labor and management, the United States and Russia, husbands and wives, and you will find a gold mine of signal reactions. In Chicago, Judge Julius Minor introduced a 60-day cooling-off period before filing for a divorce. His law requires that persons planning to file such suits first file a declaration of intention 60 days before the suit. Judge Minor said, The figures indicate that the law is helping to reduce the number of broken homes. Divorce suits filed in haste often lead to ruptured family ties, whereas reflective and more considerate action may keep the families together. Notice how a symbol reaction might even lead to longevity. A 90-year-old man was asked, what is the contributing factor toward your long life? He replied, well, when my wife and I got married, we used to argue a lot, and so we decided that whenever I got mad, that I would take a walk around the block. 
And so the one major reason for my long life is plenty of fresh air and outdoor exercise. Well, perhaps more husbands should take a walk whenever they got mad. Perhaps we should all take a walk to get away from our own anger or hatred in certain situations. Sometimes it is the best way to re-evaluate our evaluations or objectively see the other person's point of view. It is well known among psychiatrists that we are living in a neurotic age of speed. We are the victims of a speed neurosis which is a contributing factor to many of our ills, as well as misunderstandings. How can we understand people, situations, or our own children when we do not take the time? How can we get down to facts when it is so much easier and quicker to act on inferences as if they were factual? Someone once said, why is it that there is never enough time to do it right, but there is always enough time to do it over? Much time, money, and energy is wasted due to having to redo a job that should have been done correctly the first time. Haste makes waste. While this might be an old saying, it makes more sense today than ever before. The symbol reaction will give one a greater awareness and appreciation of the world around him. If we could but pause, delay, analyze, and see, we would have a deeper and truer appreciation of essentials and the differences to be found in all situations. We could learn how to get down to facts, and our decisions would have a higher degree of predictability. Dr. Sidney Blatt of Mount Sinai's Psychosomatic and Psychiatric Institute has tested almost 100 persons, mostly scientists, on an electronic problem-solving device that reveals the methods by which decisions are reached. People who make decisions efficiently act on intuition or hunches but educated hunches, he says. They gather information first by questions, but use few unnecessary questions. They assimilate and analyze a great deal of information before moving on into the unknown with a hunch. Actually, according to Dr. Blatt, the efficient decision maker takes longer to gather facts and reach the point of intuition than the inefficient one. But once at the hunch stage, he moves rapidly while the inefficient executive continues to guess and flounder. In another study, a similar conclusion was reached. A snap judgment is likely to be a bad judgment. This was found in an 18-month study of decision-making among 202 U.S. Air Force ROTC cadets at Catholic University, Washington, D.C., in a joint project of the university's psychology laboratories and ACF Electronics, a division of American Car and Foundry Industries. Those who consistently made good decisions used all the time available to them, the study showed. And, as might have been expected, it was found that intelligent individuals make better decisions. In terms of efficiency, we might define a genius or a fully functioning person in the following way. Genius is the ability to evade work by doing something right the first time it has to be done. By taking more time and pausing, delaying, and analyzing, we can save countless hours in time and a great deal of energy. In essence, we can make time and energy work for us rather than against us. These are two of man's most important related factors, and the good executive or worker in getting greater productivity and efficiency will use all available means at his disposal. 
This obviously presupposes an understanding of what constitutes efficiency, and therefore the means of achieving it. Without this knowledge, no person can truly be called a fully functioning individual. Let us present some summaries and conclusions to this signal reaction, symbol reaction principle. Number one, when we behave in terms of signal reactions, we are copying animals in our responses. We are reducing the human level of response to the animal level. I think that this is a tremendously important principle. We are reducing the human level of response to the animal level. Number two, most of the misevaluations start with a signal reaction. Signal reactions tend to produce misevaluations, whereas misevaluations follow from signal reactions. In other words, the signal reaction will lead into jumping to conclusions or misunderstandings, etc. Number three, when we do not orient our lives by symbol reactions, we do not observe the world of reality. We tend to have an immature and superficial perspective and understanding of things. We do not take time to observe, analyze, and understand. Number four, the signal reaction leads toward ignorance or lack of knowledge about many things. Number five, signal reactions not only lead toward misunderstandings, conflicts, and confusions, but they may lead toward injurious actions against others. Our tendencies to behave in terms of signal reactions may hurt others also. And number six, therefore, signal reactions tend to be anti-time binding. Symbol reactions tend to fulfill man's time binding functions and potentialities.